What's up guys? Welcome back. I'm John John the Wise. I got another cyberpunk video for you guys and this time we are going to episode two of building the campaign. This is for everyone that wants to make an epic cyberpunk campaign. If you haven't already seen episode one, make sure you guys go and check out episode one. This is going to be covering plot charts and just to preface letting you guys know that sometimes uh, some people would rather do what I'll be covering in episode three first than rather doing what I'm doing in this episode. But this is my style. This is how I do it. You can do it as you see fit. But before we get into that, make sure you guys join the Discord community. The link will be in the description below. We're a Cyberpunk Red 2020, 2077, and other tabletop game fan Discord. And we are here to help you, connect you, and just give you a cool community to talk with people about your favorite games. And make sure you guys find me on social media, at John John the Wise on everything, Twitter, Twitch, Instagram, Facebook, you name it, I'm on there. Make sure you guys are subscribed to Tabletop Cyberpunk, my podcast that is available on Spotify. It is a podcast about cyberpunk, obviously, and all kinds of other stuff, but make sure you guys join that. And make sure you guys are part of the Patreon patreon.com slash john john the wise where you'll get exclusive content like this episode of this show you'll if you're watching this on youtube sometime in the future that's because you weren't a part of the patreon and you didn't get to see this episode when it first released if you're part of the patreon you will be seeing this series exclusively thank you i really appreciate you patrons but for everybody else in the future i'll be having cool content like this and exclusive stuff so make sure you guys are part of the patreon even just to support i really appreciate it all right so in this video we are going to be taking a different look it's going to be a a different kind of screen than what you're used to this angle is not going to be the angle that you're going to be seeing yet because i have stuff that i want to show you guys on the computer some charts and uh what i'm bringing you into my the way I build my campaigns. In our first episode, we talked about all the basic stuff, writing the sentence. We talked about um, creating characters and and the, the whole idea of everything you got to do before you actually start world building and plot charting and everything. In this episode, what we're going to be doing is we're going to take the sentence, we're going to take our characters, we're going to make plot charts we're going to literally plot out our entire campaign on a chart on a spreadsheet or whatever way you guys like to do it i'll show you my way and this is going to be the first step that we go to before we even start building factions and world building and doing all the other things that you do in epic campaigns <clears throat> excuse me this is going to help you guys plot out exactly how many sessions you're going to have give or take how these sessions are going to end, how they're going to go in the beginning, how your character arcs are going to end, how your character arcs are going to be intertwined with the story. All that stuff I take into account and I chart out and I'll show you guys how I do it. All right, let's hop on the computer and I'll tell you exactly how it goes. All right, guys, here we go. This is it. We are going to begin this episode with three different charts. The first chart we're going to be talking about is the player's plot chart. The second one is going to be called the campaign plot chart. And the third one is the combined plot chart where we take the first two that I talked about and we make it into one big whole one. And this is going to be your reference for the entire campaign. All right. Now, before we get into any of that, there are a few things I wanted to tell you guys. Number one, my first rule is... This is more of a writing exercise and putting ideas down than anything set in stone. Your players are going to change things. You're going to change your mind. You're going to get inspiration. The story is going to go off the rails. All kinds of things are going to change. But this is going to help guide you in case you have writer's block or in case you have a busy lifestyle and you just don't have time to plan all the time. So you need some kind of idea on what's going to happen next you know you don't want to have to think what's going to happen next you want it to already be there and for you to just be able to add it enhance it and change a few things where you can make it a really fun experience for yourself and for your players and my other big rule is 
just write down what you know. If there are questions that you don't have answers for, like where's the setting, what car are they driving, what's the name of this NPC, skip it. Forget about it, move on, answer the questions that you know. And while you're answering those questions, you'll get inspiration for some of the other ones that you skipped and left behind. This helps you save time, it's more efficient, and it helps you move along in your writing. So make sure you guys only write down the things that you know. If you're spending too much time thinking about it, like, oh, what is his name? Where does he live? What's his family? Blah, blah, blah. All those things are just going to slow you down. Write down what you know. So the idea of the player's plot chart is we're going to be plotting down a personal story arc for each one of our players. As you can see, we have four columns here. The first one is players, then it's beginning, middle, and end. What we'll basically be doing with this chart is we're going to be plotting out a, a specific story arc for each player, how it starts, what happens in the middle, and how we're going to round it out. And once we put that onto paper, then we can realize uh, where we can put it in, in our combined plot chart and how, where we can fit it into our campaign. But before we do that, we have to have some kind of roadmap. And just like any story, I'm going to be saying this a lot in this video, stories have a beginning, stories have a middle, stories have an end. And it's no different for your players. Now, how I choose the story or plot arc for each character is I go to their backstory, I talk to my players, I say, what are your motivations? What's most important to you? Who are the most important people in your lives? And I find a small plot or story within all of that information that I think would be really cool to explore, something that we can check out. If let's say it was just like a one-on-one -on -one session, it was you and that one player, what is the one thing that you would explore with them? And you do that for each one of your players. And hopefully, if we do it right, we'll be able to mix and mingle and, and create some kind of plot where all the players are involved, all of them resolve something important. And at the end of our campaign, we resolve the overarching campaign as well. Now, talking technicalities, what I use technically right now, I'm using Google Sheets. And you can use Excel, you can use Word, you can use a pen and paper, whatever works for you. I like Google Sheets because it's free and I can access it on my phone or any device uh, as long as I sign on to my Google account. And that's what makes it interesting. So I use Google Sheets. You could put them all together and this is how it's going to look. All right, so let me give you guys an example of a player plot. Um, we're going to be talking about it from beginning, middle to end. I'm going to be using Patrick O'Hannigan, which was my Jimmy's player, Jimblesaurus Rex from my Wise Guys campaign. So we're going to take a plot from his story. And this is something that we already explored in our campaign, but I'm just using it as an example to show you guys. So when I was plotting out his campaign, I thought to myself, uh, okay, what is it in his story that's interesting? And the first thing that popped to our heads was his wife was murdered. I mean, we have to resolve that. We have to resolve what happened. That's the juiciest part of his story. There was some other stuff about enemies and allies that he grew up with. And those are cool things that we can explore in the future. But for now, the, the plot about his wife being murdered was just too juicy of a story to pass up. So in the beginning, his wife is murdered. And he's looking for revenge. Very simple plot in the beginning. I mean, this is him walking around, talking to people, going to the funeral, and trying to piece together all the clues on how this happened, right? In the middle, he finds out they were targeting his wife because she knows corporate secrets. So, in the beginning... He thought that his wife was murdered because they were actually trying to target him and she was collateral damage because he uncovered some kind of crazy conspiracy in his backstory and that made him a target for government officials and, you know, the shadow government or whatever you want to call them. And he was at a cafe eating with his wife. The cafe blew up. She died. He didn't. So he assumed that they accidentally killed her and missed him. 
But in the middle of the story, we find out that she was actually the target the entire time because she knew about corporate secrets that she never told him. So once he finds out that they murdered his wife, why they murdered her, and what the real act was, who the real bad guy was, which was a corporation that sent out that hit, there's nothing else left to do but to topple the corporation that killed his wife. All right, and we have a story arc completed. It might look very simple, but really stories are that simple. Like I said, every story has a beginning, middle, and an end. And the story about Patrick O'Hannigan getting revenge on the people that murdered his wife is right there in front of us. She was murdered. He finds out she was the target the entire time because of corporate secrets. It was a corporation that did it. He went, toppled the corporation, killed everybody involved, and got revenge for the people that murdered his wife. If we do it right, that's exactly how the story is going to go down. Our other players will have similar ideas. We'll go one by one for each one of our players. We'll do a beginning, a middle, and an end to some kind of story within their backstory that we think will be awesome to explore. Now we have this. Let's move on to plotting out the campaign. Okay, this is the campaign plot chart. I'm just going to make it a little bit bigger on these ends so we're not wasting any space. There we go. All right, so this campaign plot chart is separated instead of the first one where it had the players. This is separated into acts, and each act will have a beginning, a middle, and an end. The overarching campaign plot is always going to be there. It's one of those things that the players slowly chip away at, and if we don't give them little semblances of of success and and it feels like they're moving it forward then they're going to feel like they're stuck in the mud that's why you have to have a beginning a middle of an end to acts to be able to round it out now why did i choose three acts you could do two acts you can even do one act to be honest with you but i feel like three acts is just perfect enough it's just enough that goes on that it's epic and long and 18, 20 sessions. And by the time we're done with everything, that's where we're going to be at. So in this corner, I have the sentence, which is the important part. If you saw episode one, that's the important part of our campaign. That is the overarching story. It's the reason for the story that will go in this box. And then we'll go one by one. We'll break down the sentence into however many acts you think it'll take. So remember, every story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And even the stories within the stories have a beginning, a middle, and an end. So let's talk about examples. Okay, so our example sentence that was in episode one is the following. And let me just wrap the text. And you'll be doing a lot of fun stuff like this as you are creating your charts. Biotechnica wants to create a new hybrid AI system using human consciousness, similar to the Soul Killer program, as soon as possible. Though they are close to achieving that, there are factors that are hindering them, such as the players. It's not the perfect sentence grammatically, but it's it does the job. It's our formula. We know exactly what Biotechnica is trying to do. We know why they're having issues, and we know that we have a story here that we can understand. So now I want to break down this sentence, this story into three different versions where the story uh, has maybe three different clues for the players, three different locations and three different ways that they can interact with this sentence to come to a final conclusion. Just like I said in the past, a beginning, a middle and an end. Act one will be the beginning act. So everything that happens in act one is introductions is stuff that we can get used to and like act one beginning is the players meeting up and we need to pick a setting so players in setting players meeting important npcs players learning about biotechnica's involvement in the area so my players in act one in the beginning are not gonna know the whole thing. They're not gonna know everything that's going on. They're just gonna know Biotechnica's in the area. They're doing things. It's really all a mystery. It's shrouded in mystery. They're talking to NPCs. They're learning things about the setting. And in that, in the middle of that, 
something happens that is important to the plot that moves the beginning along. Okay, so the beginning of Act 1, the players learn that NPCs, that allied NPCs have been kidnapped. Sorry about my terrible spelling. And are at a local lab. Okay? The players learn that. And however they learn that is up to you. They go to a, t a bar, they go to a nightclub, they go to a fixer spot. Whatever it is that they need to do, you can add combat, you can add role play. We'll get into all that later, but basically they come in, they kind of get settled in. People tell them what's going on around the area without giving them the entire plot because even the NPCs don't know this plot. This is a secret plot, right? The sentence is a secret that only we know. Now, in the middle of Act 1, they find out something happened. You got to give them something to explore, something interesting. So they know Biotechnica is involved and they know they've kidnapped somebody. At the end, boss fight, epic, uh, um, find kidnapped NPCs, rescue them, learn clues that lead them to Act 2. So in the beginning, in Act 1, they get settled in. In the middle, they hear someone got kidnapped by Biotechnica. They go to the place where the person was kidnapped and they rescue them or they find the dead body or whatever it is. And that leads them to Act 2. Whatever happens at this epic boss fight lets them know that there's more to this story than, that, than they know. And there's more to this mystery. So Act 1 is all about introductions for them to figure out who the bad guys are, who the good guys are, how they operate, what they'll be used to. You'll be introducing them to things that will be commonplace, like uh, Biotechnica net running systems. They'll be like, oh yeah, I've, been, I've seen it. This is how they usually set them up. The weapons that the goons use, the way they operate, all that stuff will be introduced to them in Act 1. And They'll have an awesome, cool boss fight by the end of Act 1 that'll make it feel like they've progressed, but there's so much more to realize. And Act 2 will be the middle part. In the middle of Act 2, they'll be taking stuff from the end. Act 1 end clues. Um, speaking to new people. Finding next, lo next location to further plot then in the middle of act two it's going to be a different story that you give them they find a warehouse filled with guns ammo and cyber and um, prototype cyberware in this warehouse is the new soul killer type AI system and the players battle must battle it all right so in the middle of the second act they get a taste more of a taste of this sentence of ours we introduce them to this hybrid AI system then they start thinking like okay there there's definitely something going on more than what we had just learned in the beginning it's not just about kidnapping the beginning of in act one we were dealing with kidnapping that's what the situation was and biotechnica being involved in the area in act two we realized that there is a lot more nefarious things going on the kidnapping was just the tip of the iceberg but the deeper we go into the story we realize that there's all kinds of goodies and 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 stuff that biotechnica has that is not above board and the players have stumbled upon something bigger than them at the end, combat this AI system, steal corporate secrets, and uncover plot to destroy allied NPCs, and the plot is already in motion. So at the end of the second act, the players have combated this AI system They've seen what it can do, they've seen what it's capable of, and they realize now that, okay, Biotechnica is, now they know the, sen the sentence is happening. 
Biotechnica is trying to make some kind of AI system. The players have stumbled upon it. And now that Biotechnica knows that the players have stumbled upon it, they are taking, they're putting plans in motion to destroy the players and the NPCs that they're allied with. That was basically the story of my last campaign. And that's the end of that one. So Act 3 is going to be all about rounding out all this information, the kidnapping, the AI, the warehouse, the prototype stuff, and how Biotechnica is going to do the things that they do. I won't fill out the beginning and middle, but at the end, Biotechnica is destroyed in the local area or is significantly hindered to the point of abandoning their project. That's how it's supposed to end. And, you know, of course, big epic boss fight. Because if you don't have a big epic boss fight at the end of Act 3, at the last part of your campaign, then, I don't know, man, you're kind of doing it wrong. It's got to feel bigger than everything. If you get to this area with your group, then you guys have done like 20 sessions, 22 sessions. I don't even know how many but you guys are up there in sessions and hours. So this has to feel like at the end of this campaign, we've done something crazy. Now, you guys might think this is cool already, the campaign plot chart. This is already a cool story, sort of. We'll go back into it. We'll edit it. We'll make it more defined. These are just all general ideas. We'll put names. We'll put faces. We'll put factions. That's all stuff that we do in our world building that we'll bring back into these charts. That's why I said in the beginning of the video that some people might want to do episode three first, the stuff that I cover in episode three, and then come back to these charts. I personally like to plot out the chart in a general way. Then I do the world building, and then I bring those world building aspects back into the combined plot chart, which we'll talk about next. And that's when we have this big, giant, beautiful, wrapped up bow plot chart that tells us everything that's going to be going on. So... As cool as this campaign plot chart is, and as many ideas as we have, the only problem is it, our players are not connected to this chart in any way. They are just players. That's it. They're just playing this game. It's like you open up a board game, and you pick your pawn, and you put your pawn on the board, you roll the dice, and you start playing. And, and that's basically what this campaign is. But role-playing games give you that opportunity where you can discover your players and discover things about them and their stories that you could go deeper into that you wouldn't be able to into in board games and stuff like that so let's move on to the combined plot chart now this chart is a little bit different than the last one it is similar to the campaign plot chart but as you can see there's two middles here right so like this one, there was only one middle. The other one, there's two. You might even want to do a third middle. It's up to you. But the basic idea is we are taking the campaign plot chart and we are trying to figure out how we can connect our players to it, how we can connect the players to each other and make this big, giant abomination that's beautiful, that connects all of our players, all their allies, all their NPCs and the plot into one big thing. It's an ambitious thing to do. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be perfect. But if you put in the time and the care, your players will understand that you're doing that. And I think that they would actually appreciate the fact that the, that their character is actually being looked at, even if it's not perfect. OK, so let me tell you how I would do this. So looking at our first one. As you can see, Patrick O'Hannigan's wife is murdered and he's looking for revenge. That's the beginning of Patrick O'Hannigan's plot chart. And in the beginning here, it says players in setting, players meeting, important NPCs, and learning about Biotechnica's involvement. So this is a perfect time for the Patrick O'Hannigan to meet people that meets... Patrick O'Hannigan meets, and I'm kind of doing all this on the fly. Patrick O'Hannigan meets NPCs that have been uh, ravaged by Biotechnica forces. And these NPCs are allied with him, with Patrick. 
They are deeply sorry about what happened to his wife and also give him information about his wife's murder. So, I have combined Act 1 of the campaign and Act 1, or the beginning, of Patrick O'Hannigan's plot chart. Now, you might be asking, which player do I pick? Who do I pick? How do I decide which one of my players is in the beginning? You just pick one. You put two of them together if you want. If you can combine two different stories, like going over here in this plot chart, if I have a uh, Joe and uh, his wife is, uh, uh, we'll say that um, he's looking for a hitman. Well, hey, maybe that same hitman is the one that killed Patrick's wife. So let's go over here to our plot chart. And we'll say about his wife's murder, they introduce him to Joe, who is a solo that's looking for a hitman that goes by the same name as the one that killed Patrick's wife. So as you can see, we've connected two players to the plot, to the overarching campaign, and we've taken their stories and involved it into the plot as well. We've intertwined it. So they're finding out information of the overarching plot, and they're also exploring parts of their story at the same time. Now, we're going to move on to the middle here. So finds out they were targeting his wife because she knows corporate secrets. And Joe's hitman, uh, let's say, uh, let's see, finds out they were targeting his wife because she knows corporate secrets. He's looking for a hitman. Hitman is actually his biological twin. All right. Finds out it's his brother. Now, we'll move on here. Act one, players learn the allied NPCs have been kidnapped and are at a local lab. Okay. so. Where would he find out it was his biological twin? Well, that information's at the lab. For some reason, it's in the computer as one of the uh, bad guys that have been working for Biotechnic. So how do we connect that to Patrick? Uh, let's see. Patrick and Joe find that uh, kidnapped NPCs are at Biotechnica lab. Upon reaching the lab, they find a computer that has information about Patrick's wife and a man that looks exactly like Joe. With DNA tracking, with DNA uh, comparison from Joe and the hitman, we find that they are biological twins. Kidnapped NPCs are also here dead or alive question mark so i put question mark because i don't know i don't know if i want them to be dead or alive we'll figure that out later on but basically those npcs are there all right so that's the beginning middle and we can then go from there and now we have a middle two so what is this middle two this middle two is giving you extra wiggle room where you can put a pause on the overarching campaign. So we know the next step is a big boss fight. Okay, so there's a little bit of a conflict here. I've been kidnapped and are at a local lab. Okay, so we, we kind of moved it up and I kind of I kind of messed up a little bit. They got to the lab already. So the, the kidnapping will, will be different. Uh, kidnapped are at local lab. Players reach local lab, okay? And boss fight, um, find other kidnapped. NPCs. So there's other NPCs that were also kidnapped that weren't there, and maybe they're still alive. They were taken to another location. All right, we fixed it. See, and this is what you do. You go back, you fix conflicts, you fix things, and by the time you're done, it's going to look great. Now, for all of you that are like, man, this is so much goddamn work. I'm telling you, once you get it all done, you do this kind of preparation. This is the type of preparation that makes campaigns epic. You don't have to go this deep. You don't have to go this hardcore. This is just the way I do things. And if you guys want to copy me, you're more than welcome to. All right. So like I said, middle two gives us a little bit more wiggle room where we can explore uh, what's going on with targeting his wife, the hitman and his biological twin. 
we could find more stuff about that. Maybe they find the hitman. They find the hitman, Joe's biological twin, and we don't know what happens there. I don't, I honestly don't know what I would do there. I don't know, you know, I'm thinking Joe's biological twin might not have known that he has a twin, and then once they see each other, maybe he has a change of heart, maybe he starts helping them, but at the same time, Patrick's like, I gotta murder this guy. He killed my wife. But the twin lets them know twin okay well let's say that twin uh is has change of heart when seeing joe decides to spill everything he knows and it turns out he wasn't directly involved with killing patrick's wife because patrick would not let him live if he was directly involved but he knows who is gives names locations and everything. These are Biotechnica connected people. All right, now we have the perfect setup for this end of this campaign, for this uh, for this act. We're going to be tying and and uh, tying a bow around two different campaign arcs with two of our players. We're going to find. Uh, hitman is actually his biological twin and then he's looking for a hitman hitman is actually his biological twin then finds out biotechnica separated them at birth and wants revenge for the brainwashing they did to his brother and ooh, let's let's um let how about uh how about we kill his brother? His brother dies. So Biotechnica connected people. Suddenly everyone is attacked and Joe's brother is shot to shot in the head from a sniper from a sniper. So they're having this conversation, uh Biotechnica being this all big giant corporation finds out there that one of their assets is out there talking to the NPCs that they're having issues with or that they might have issues with and they don't like that he's spilling the beans and they send out a corporate hit squad to kill him he gets killed right in front of his newly uh suddenly uh, he just realized that he has a brother Joe's like oh my god I have a brother the hitman that I've been trying to go after is my brother and he just dies in my arms before I could even ask him what his favorite color is so that's something fun that gives us two different players that will want to get revenge on biotechnica so the ending is biotechnica epic fight where patrick kills people involved with his wife's death biotechnica corporate security goons hitmen whatever they're called and and joe gets revenge on the sniper that killed his brother and the biotechnica execs that were involved with his separation at birth okay so act one of our combined plot chart just to go over it again is patrick meets npcs they are ravaged by biotechnica forces and they're allied with Patrick. They're deeply sorry for what happened with his wife. And they introduce him to Joe, who is a solo that's looking for a hitman that goes by the same name as the one that killed Patrick's wife. They find out that the, uh, they find them at the lab. They find some kidnapped NPCs at the biotechnica lab that gives them further information about what happened to Patrick's wife. And they find out that the hitman that Joe is after is actually his brother, his biological twin, and that there are more kidnapped NPCs at another location. So that from there we realize, and I'm thinking, this is, this is like improvisational thinking that I'm doing right now. This usually I take a lot of time to try to figure out and I'm trying to jumble it all into one video. After that, they find the hitman, uh, Joe's biological twin, and they have a conversation they get more information they realize that he wasn't actually directly involved with killing patrick's wife he didn't even hire the hit squad he's just a part of biotechnica's hit crew he wasn't actually there he wasn't involved with it he could have been 
it, it was luck that he wasn't, but he wasn't actually there. He didn't pull any triggers. He's just part of the organization that did what, what happened to his wife. Joe has a change of heart, realizes this is my brother, and why don't I just try to get to know him? Boom, he gets shot from a sniper. There goes the family reunion. At the end, we realize that Biotechnica is at another location. They have other NPCs that have been kidnapped. And Joe and Patrick, they go together. They both have a dog in this fight. They go to Biotechnica and they kill the hitman that killed Joe's brother, that killed Patrick's wife, and bada bing, bada boom. At the end of this act, we also get clue into next act. That part I forgot to add in. So by the end of act one, we have figured out who killed Patrick's wife, what happened, he got semi-revenge. He really wants Biotechnica to be completely destroyed because of what they did to his family and his wife. And now his new friend, he witnessed how they've destroyed his new friend's life too. So now they want to, now they're not only deeply invested in what happened in their story, they're also deeply invested what's going on in the campaign, the overarching plot, because I've connected them to it. Now moving on to Act 2, what we'll do is we'll continue with the same campaign where Act 1 and Clues, speaking to new people, finding loca next location to further the plot, find a warehouse, soul killer, AI, all that stuff is in Act 2. But now we can go back to this player plot chart as well. And maybe there's another story that we add here for Patrick and Joe. Or maybe you have player 3 and player 4 plots to try to go through as well so these guys are kind of taking a little bit of a back seat in the first act but in the second act they you know and and players might want to play a supportive role they're they're you just have to feel for them it's all about group dynamics if somebody feels left out then all you have to do is just introduce one or two npcs from player three and four in this whole scenario so in this combined plot chart i'll say um over here Make sure player three ally is discovered here. And in the other middle, make sure player four enemy is discovered here. So it's very simple. In player three's ally is discovered, they're in trouble. Maybe they're one of the kidnapped NPCs. Luckily, like it just happens that way. In player four's scenario, the players are on their way to like the lab and play one of player four's enemies ambushes them because they find their location. So now I've made everybody involved with the campaign, even though player three and four take kind of a little bit of a backseat and a supportive role. I still threw in like a little splash of their story into this entire campaign to make them feel like they're we're investing in their story as well. That's pretty much that. Act two, I'll go back and make sure that player three's beginning, middle, and end, and player four's beginning, middle, and end plays a bigger part in these acts, and Patrick and Joe will play more of a supporting role. In act three, I might just go straight plot campaign. I just, I'll just do the campaign, because by the time we get to act three, that means that all of my players have their stories figured out they have one part of their story or a plot in their in their backstory that we've discovered that we've looked through and now in act three we're going to be just going straight into the plot i don't have an answer for act three i don't have an answer for act two right now i might even just skip this whole thing because i already have enough for look how many sessions we have here one two three four this is minimum four sessions here minimum because each one of these could possibly be two sessions two and a half one and a half you don't know until you start playing and you don't know if you're going to be adding to this subtracting to it you don't know what's going to happen but you know at least to a minimum if this story is on rails and you have mindless players that don't ruin the plot then you're going to have four sessions where you have everything planned out now by the time you're done, that's four times three. That's 12 sessions here of two to four hours. 
12 sessions is usually not how it goes. It's usually like 18 or 20 because these become one and a half or two or or I change things and things move around. So, but at a bare minimum, I have 12 sessions completely planned out by the time I finish finish this chart. And they include my characters, they include the sentence, they include overarching campaign, they include backstory, and they make sure that all of the players are invested with each other and the plot. I know this has been a little bit convoluted, I know it's a lot of information, but I hope you guys have a look at this and it gives you an idea of what to do. You might want to skip this entirely. Like I said, this is just the way that I do things. This might be a little bit too much for you. Maybe you don't want to go too deep into your player's plot chart. Maybe you don't want to connect them to the sentence all that much because you just want to tell a story. If that's the case, the campaign plot chart is everything that you need. Maybe you don't even care about an overarching campaign and you care about your story, the, your player's stories. And that's what it's all about. Then the player's plot chart is your entire campaign. But if you're like me and you're a psycho and you don't mind doing this kind of work, then you put together all of them all together, allies, enemies, campaign plot lines, and you interweave them and you make this crazy abomination that partially makes sense and is just chaos. But it's controlled chaos because we put it down on paper and we have an idea of exactly how our first four sessions, minimum four sessions, are going to go right now in the course of this story or this video, which has been less than an hour. We have figured all of that stuff out. All right. So thank you guys so much. I really appreciate the support. If you guys have any more questions about this plot chart or things, which I'm sure you will, Leave it down in the comments. Hit me up on social media. Join our Discord community where we can talk more about it. And thank you so much to all my patrons and your patronage and your support. I really appreciate you guys. Have a wonderful day, a wonderful week, and we'll see you guys on the next one. Oh, wait, before we say goodbye, next episode we will be talking about world building, settings, factions, allies, enemies all that stuff. And we're going to make sure that our players are involved with that too, because that's what I love to do, right? Love connecting my players to it. So join me on the next one. All right. Bye.